101, the course that will give you wings. Section 5, Aircraft Systems and Structures. Lesson 5.3, the electrical system, lights and electrical consumers. If you walk inside an airplane nowadays, chances are you'd be surrounded by computers and electrical components such as screens, lights, even the flight controls are electrical nowadays. The industry is slowly changing towards an electrical future. It is then not really a surprise that the electrical system is one of the most important systems nowadays. Um, in our little aircraft, this is no different. Uh, at the beginning, aircraft were meant to fly visually with just the stick and the rudder and uh, basically were two wings attached to an engine that could be flown with only the hands. However, nowadays electrical components and electrical systems are getting more and more important. By the way, before I forget, I've gathered the diagrams of the electrical system of the Cessna 172 in the documentation section, so you can download it and have a global vision of the system while we take a look at it. So now let's get started. This is the way this lesson is going to be structured. First, we are going to learn about the electrical system. We're going to compare the three models, point out the most important and decisive differences between them. After, we'll take a look at the lights of the Cessna 172, where to locate them, how to check them, uh, how they be operated from the cockpit. I don't know, basically uh, everything you need to know about the lights. The last part is going to be dedicated to the electrical consumers. And we'll be paying attention today to the use of radios for navigating and also communicating. Um, the computers that compose the Garmin 1000 because, as you know, uh, from previous sections, there are two big screens, but there is a lot behind that. And the FATEC, the Full Authority Digital Engine Controller. Basically, it's a new thing that has been coming up the last years in small aircraft and basically controls the engine. We, we'll, see, we'll see about that. And it's maybe a concept that is new for some of you. Anyway, we're going to get started. In this first slide, uh, it shows the diagram of the electrical system of the Cessna 172 November. Remember, the oldest of the variants we're going to be seeing in this course. It might seem like a mess at first, but we're going to break it down in smaller pieces. Don't worry. Uh, this is going to be for easier understanding. We're going to break it down into three parts. Consumers, producers, and the system, right? A producer produces energy that is transformed and moved through a system and then the consumers consume this energy. All right. Well, now to the right, as displayed in red, you can see the consumers of the system. As you can see, all the consumers such as lights, radios, systems or displays are linked to these two big bars called a bus. A bus is basically a way to organize electrical loads. This way we can regroup the loads to our convenience, reducing the connectors used and also simplifying the system. This is more or less just like sockets at home, right? Imagine you want to plug in your computer, you want to plug in your iPad or your uh, tablet, whatever you want to plug in. Your brother wants to plug in his uh, computer game, your mom wants to plug in the TV and you basically only have one plug. Then you can need a socket to concentrate all the loads in that socket and then connect that socket to the electricity. Well, this is how bars work in aircraft. Um, basically, the bus in the upper side is the primary bus. All the electrical loads are connected to it. And just under it, we have the avionics bus. The second bus will gather all the loads related to avionics, such as radios, the transponder, or maybe even the autopilot if we have one fitted. This is because of something called transistent loads. All right, if you turn on and off a light, nothing's gonna happen, right? The light's not gonna break. You can turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, turn it on. Nothing's gonna happen. Now, think about your computer. Imagine you push the on button on your computer, and then you push off again, and on, and off, and on, and off again. Yes, you're gonna end up breaking it. 
Avionics are really expensive, they are really hard to maintain, so we need to protect them. And the way to protect them is mix them all together in a bus that is protected from these transistor loads that can happen when uh, we start the engine, for example. Uh, all the loads are connected via a breaker. As you can see here, there is a pointer in the screen. All these uh, round things are called breakers. So a breaker is more or less something like a fuse. It's a fuse you can reset. Okay, well, let's, let's build on that. It prevents the circuit from overtension if a system is faulty and it allows us to isolate the system, to automatically isolate the system. For example, we have a broken light, right? But we don't really need that light. So we don't want that system to affect other systems with sparks, overheating, I don't know, overtensions. So we use these breakers to automatically isolate the faulty system, just like we do at home. In aviation, you pull the circuit breaker to open the circuit, therefore the system is gonna, not, not going to work, and then you push the circuit breaker in order to make the system work again. Breakers are usually placed to the left side, downside, left downside of the cockpit in the Cessna 172. So these consumers uh, that we're going to see now, this, all these consumers that are surrounded in red, they're going to need some kind of energy to work. We need producers, right? As we said before, suppliers of energy. These supplies of energy are now depicted in green in the screen and you can see all the energy producers that this Cessna in particular has, right? So um, at most we have the alternator right there, right here. This is the alternator and uh, this is a rotating coil that is connected to the engine and using the engine rotation produces electric energy. If the engine stops or rotates too slow, the alternator is not going to work, right? then it's not going to produce the energy. This can happen, I don't know, I can think about two cases, a failure of the engine or a low RPM in the engine. That can also happen if, if, the, if the engine doesn't have enough speed to build up that momentum and create that energy that we're going to be using, the system is not going to be working. Right, well below the alternator right here, we can see the ground service plug, right? So this is the ground connection. If the engine is stopped and we need some kind of an electrical energy for some reason, we can just plug an, an external generator to the left side of the coal to supply the energy. Okay, uh, most important thing about this, and remember this whenever you operate the system, don't forget to close the coal. All right, well, the last part right here, we can see a battery. There's like a, a drawing of a battery. Airplanes are always required to carry a source of store energy. This is where the batteries come into play. The main function of a battery is serving as a backup in case of um, alternator failure or alternator just not being able to provide a systems with electricity. So um, it's going to be able to provide some continuous flow, some continuous kind of flow of energy as we will see later. We need to make sure that the battery is loaded, of course, and we need to be careful not to inadvertently discharge it, all right? If you forget lights, you forget systems on, you're going to discharge the battery, and we don't want that because without a battery, we cannot start the engine, therefore, we cannot start the alternator, therefore, we are not going to have electricity, and as we said at the beginning, electricity is crucial for us. The Cessna 172 November is the first model that featured a 28 volt current instead of the 14 volt that was used before the Cessna 172 November. So anyway, now in yellow we have another system. We have one switch here, the master switch, another switch here, the avionics, then we have the starter, and then the magnetos got a double surrounding you will say well that, that's probably a mistake of the video right like this, this course is not that good there, there's a mistake no i've uh, done this with the magnetos because they are probably the most important and the weirdest to say it somehow system that you can find here all right well let's let's go part by part 
Now appearing in yellow in the screen, there are the series of switches. These switches can form the logic part of the system. We as pilots are going to give inputs to these uh, switches and we're going to decide which supplier and which consumer is going to consume that energy, right? Again, not too different from what we do at home. We have switches all around the house. I want to use this light. Okay, I switch on this light. I want to use this other light. I switch on that other light. So it's just the same thing. So basically, the upmost switch is the master switch, as so, uh, we can see right here uh, in your cockpit. This is the big red button placed next to all the light switches. If you follow the lines, right, you follow these lines, you take your time, you follow these lines from the battery, again, etc. You're going to see that it connects with the battery and the alternator. So basically, it's a double switch you can control whether if the generator supplies the energy and whether if uh, the battery supplies or not that energy, right? We can see a series of connectors between them, like uh, this one, for example, or this one, this one, this one. Not really important, guys. This is just logic, okay? These this are just relays that are going to relay the following logic. If the alternator is walking, the alternator loads the battery, okay? Alternator works, alternator loads the battery. Alternator working, alternator feeds the avionics. Alternator fails, then the battery is going to take over, okay? This is abnormal situation. The battery is going to take over for engine start to provide uh, all the primary bus and provide the avionics bus, okay? That's basically how it works. Then we can see the starter in the left right here. We can see it. The starter, as you might imagine, is a system to start the engine, right? Uh, basically, it's a motor that consumes energy to transform it into movement. It moves the engine upon starting, just like you would do with your hands. And this is just like when you turn your keys in your car. It's highlighted in yellow and not in red because it's a bit of a special system, okay? It's, it's not just a consumer. The starter could also be powered by the ground unit to start the engine without a battery, okay? And uh, in the procedure section, we will see how this works. Careful, the starter, okay, right here, this starter has nothing to do with the spark plugs in the engine, okay? The starter only rotates the engine for startup. It does have nothing to do with igniting the mixture, creating fire, creating explosions, nothing. I've heard all of that in my classes. No, that is not correct. The starter only moves the engine around, just like you would do with your hands in older airplane. All right, good. Let's keep going. The last system depicted here is the magnetos. Uh, yeah, they have a funny name. They have a funny operation. So let's take a look at them. Um, right here, we can see uh, the magnetos coming up in the screen. This is a magneto and this is the spark plug. Okay, question for you guys. Um, does the spark plug something to do with the starter? No, right? No, it has nothing to do with the starter. The magnetos have something to do with the starter? No, it has nothing to do with the starter. Anyway, um, as a brief description of what magnetos are, they trigger the spark in the spark plugs. And you will ask me, well, if, wait, wait a minute. If I need this for engine to run, what happens if the electrical suppliers fail? Will the engine fail as well due to the lack of spark? The answer here is no. Well, this is because magnetos have two phases of operation, as we are going to see right now. There are two modes of operation. Engine start. The magnetos are going to use electricity from the batteries or the GPU to start sparking the mixture. Right now, once the engine is running, the magnetos are automatically going to disconnect from the electrical system. They're going to become self-sufficient and they're going to use that rotation, just like the alternator. They're going to use that engine rotation to keep producing sparks. So even if you have a complete engine failure, you're never going to lose your magnetos. Okay, that's that's the special thing about the magnetos. 
So let's go back to this uh, graph. We have the same as we had before. And now these systems are coming up in blue. You can see right there, you see the clock and you see the flight hour recorder. Well, um, yeah, these are a couple systems that are highlighted in blue, the clock, the flight hour recorder. Uh, they are hot wired to the battery and they never stop working. Think about it. A clock that only works when the system is energized wouldn't really be too useful, right? And a system that records flight hours that you could just simply shut down by flicking the alternator or flicking the battery switch, it wouldn't really be too profitable for flight offices and schools. I mean, think about it. Oh, I don't want to do flight hours today. Uh, I'm feeling like I want to save this money for something else. I'm just going to switch this off real quick. Now, that, that's not an option. Uh, yeah, and the system also features some um, ammeter. You can see some indicators here. But anyway, as I said, not too important. Over, or, uh, over voltage warning light. Um, yeah, basically indicators we have uh, we, we have seen in them in the uh, instrument section we, we're just gonna keep going and take a look at something else this is pretty pretty much it uh, I mean at the beginning it might seem like a big mess but in the end when it comes down to it it's just a couple supplies couple consumers and some systems in between that are gonna make it way more interesting but that, that's it consumers a system and providers right now we're going to take a look at the differences with the newer models. Now, this is the system of the Cessna 172 Romeo. It's similar to the November kind. Uh, as you can see, the graph is a bit newer. I got the older graph from Emmanuel in 1978, I think it was. This one is from the 90s, so that's kind of newer. Uh, yeah, as you can see, the first thing is A and B consumers. We don't have all the loads here, like uh, lights, flaps, whatever. No, we have A consumers, B consumers, like the other one, just the same. Okay, if you go to the manual, you could see which loads specifically are connected to which line. Okay, but they don't show it here for ease of understanding. Don't worry, not a big problem. Okay. A uh, big thing here, we have an electrical fuel pump that is going to be provided by this system that is new in this engine and we will see in the engine section why they did it like this. The switches are exactly the same, the providers are exactly the same. We have the alternator, the battery, the external power and the magnetos and then you can see here also two relays, the master big red button this this one is here this is the master red button and i have put this one here i will tell you now why okay so uh the producers as i said they are always the same this one and the other one right but there is a change here we have something called standby battery the standby battery is just a specific battery we have in this kind of cessna right let's think about it for a second in the other Cessna, in the Cessna 172 November, you had a uh, couple of instruments, couple of lights, nothing too electronic, nothing too big. Well, now in front of you, you have kind of like a really big TV. I mean, my laptop is not as big as that screen in the Garmin 1000. So, I mean, with that big screen, all the computers that we're gonna see after, you're gonna need a lot of electricity. So in order to supply at least 30 minutes of flight time with instruments, you are gonna need this standby battery that is gonna supply this kind of systems. And uh, basically that's pretty much it with this system. As you can see, it's surrounded. All right. So this is the Cessna 172 SP FADEC. And it's a bit similar to the Cessna 172 Romeo. So, uh, is that right? I mean, we have buses, avionics, more buses. Oh, wow. This looks nothing like the other one. Okay, let's try and break it down like we always do. 
It's similar to the Romeo, but uh, the big change here is probably going to be the Fatek, right? That's, that's going to be the, well, it's going to be the master change from this to the last Cessna we talked about. So yeah, the consumers are going to be basically the same. Okay, as you can see here, the electrical bus one is connected to the avionics bus one. And down there in the screen, the avionics bus two is connected to the electrical bus two. We have switches. Okay, we have the starter. We have switches, 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 more switches, and a diode. So yeah, it looks pretty similar. I mean, the drawing is way better, but it looks pretty similar. Difference now is that there is a Vionics Bus 1 connected to an Electrical Bus 1 and a Vionics Bus 2 connected to the Electrical Bus 2. Due to the fact that we have more Avionics, we have two buses for Avionics, not just one. So um, logic might help you here. If Electrical Bus 2 fails, logic tells us that a Vionics Bus 2 is going to fail as well. Well, that is correct. If we lose this bus, we're going to lose this bus because they're connected, right? So if the battery is here, the battery provides energy, has to go all the way around here. So if this is broken, the avionics bus is going to be broken as well. Anyway, the connectors are pretty much the same. Let's see about the changes. Producers, we have the external power. We knew that. We have the battery, we knew that as well. We had the alternator, we knew that as well. What, what is this? Backup battery. Oh, it's, it's a new battery, but we had a backup battery before. No, that's the standby battery, careful. Okay? We need to difference between the backup battery and the standby battery. Standby battery was for instruments, backup battery is just for the FADIC. As you can see here, there is a diode here that is not going to allow the current to go in this direction. It's only going to be allowed to go in this direction. So we have a battery just for the FADIC. Can you tell me why this is like that? Yes, that's it. No FADIC, no engine. FADIC stands for Full Authority Digital Engine Controller. Full Authority engine controller so basically it's a computer that controls our engine so if we don't have that computer our engine is gonna stop it's gonna be out of control so this battery is only for the FADIC okay this battery is gonna allow us to have 30 minutes of FADIC operation it allows us to fly for 30 more minutes in case we have a complete electrical failure. All right, we will see in the manual after procedure section how to deal with this kind of failure, but basically you need to get to land quick because you're gonna have 30 minutes, all right? As we can see here, this is the FADIC. This is what I just explained to you. Um, the FADIC is going to be connected via a CrossFit bus. That is a big difference as well. This CrossFit bus basically connects electrical bus 1 with electrical bus 2. So in case one of these systems is not working properly, the other one can take over. That's basically what it is. And it's really important because the two main differences in this electrical system is that we have a FADIC and we have multiple electrical loads that we have to uh, supply. Also, we have this backup battery, we have already talked about it, just for the FADIC. Standby batteries for the instruments, for having a longer flight time with instruments in glass cockpit aircraft, backup battery is for the FADIC. No electricity, no FADIC, no FADIC, no energy in the engine. The engine is dead, okay? So, once that is clear, um, there's a master for the engine, that, that's, that's a, a bit different. The starter is not connected by a switch, it's connected by a push button. We will see it in the engine section. And there is an engine master, so, so we have two buttons for starting the engine. We will see how it is. Basically, with the engine master, you power the FADIC, okay? So the FADIC controls the engine. If you want the engine to start, the first thing you need to start 
is the FADIC. When you start the engine master, you tell the FADIC, hey, I want you to walk, I want you to start this engine, and then you touch the start push button. But as I said, we will talk about this in another lesson. Anyway, we have more switches and uh, we have the FADEC as a consumer. I wanted to leave this for the last part. The FADEC is the most important consumer in this system. Imagine. Now we're going to talk about lights. All right. Uh, lights, the bulbs, switches, the inside and the outside. So um, we're going to be talking about the use of these lights in the procedures. For now, we're just going to be talking about the kinds of lights we use and the angles that the lights cover. Okay, it's really important to know this. You might have studied it in uh, ATC or some kind of um, subject related to aviation before this, but if you haven't, that's all right. So right here, these are the switches that we have in the cockpit down there, and uh, they basically tell you which light you're operating, so you don't need to memorize where light is. Just think that lights are gonna be in your left hand, Probably. And the Cessna 172 Romeo with the Garmin 1000 installed. The uh, system or the panel is a bit different, but not too big of a difference, just uh, the arrangement. All right. So uh, now we are going to just take a look at how the Cessna looks out at night. Well, we have the beacon light. The beacon light, we have it right here. The beacon light is a big red beacon, okay? A beacon is what sailors use not to crash into the shore, okay? It tells us, well, it tells everybody around us, hey, we have an engine, we are dangerous, we are moving. It has to be on from the moment you start the engine till the moment you shut down your engine because that's the moment when you are dangerous for others, okay? The landing light. Landing light is located here, but in the Cessna 172 November is going to be located there, just underneath the propeller. Okay, the landing and the taxi light. They are both together here. In the Cessna 172 November, they are going to be both together there. Okay, landing light is a really thin light that is going to illuminate in front of us. Okay, it's for landing, for takeoff. Okay. Basically, you go into the runway, you're clear for takeoff. You want to see the center line as good as you can. You want to see the runway as good as you can so you can avoid any other traffic, any car that crosses, any animal, whatever. Okay, the, you want to, to be seen in the air, so it's a really bright light. Then we have the taxi light that is next to it and is used for taxiing. It has a bit less of power, but the angle that it can illuminate is wider. Okay, if you want to know more about these lights, I recommend you take a look at the download section because there, 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 are, there is a document that I have uploaded that basically shows how the um, different lights are arranged and the angles that those lights have to display. Okay, there's a regulation here. And, uh, you cannot just light a candle and put it in the top of the aircraft. Okay. Well, the, the next lights are the navigation lights. We have one here at the wingtip, another one here at the wingtip, and one in the tail. This one's gonna be white. This one, left side of the airplane, is gonna be red. And this one, right side of the airplane, is gonna be green, just like in boats. We use this to tell others our relative position. If you see in front of you a big red light, not the beacon, another red light. You know that you are seeing my left wing, so you can act appropriately to avoid me. That, that's pretty much it. We will work with this. We will do a couple of exercises uh, during the um, course, but for now, that, that's pretty much it. Then we have the strobe light. We have a strobe light here, and we have a strobe light there. It's basically a flashing light. A flashing light that is gonna be flashing and showing others, hey, I'm here, I'm flying. We don't want to crash, so we might have to change our course. So that's it. It's just a light to avoid crashing into the others. Okay. So that's pretty much the lights of the Cessna for you. Um, we also have inner lights. Okay. I almost forgot about them. We almost have um, four, I think it is. Yeah. We have 
illumination in the panels, we have illumination in the back of the aircraft, and some Cessnas feature a light under the wing, under wing light. I don't know, maybe you're camping in uh, the bush in the plains of Canada or something like that with your plane and you need to eat your sandwich under the wing because it's dark outside. Well, then you can light that light. Yeah, it's a pretty good idea. Should do it someday. And we have talked about the lights and now it's coming. Now it's coming the radios, okay, for navigating and communicating. So uh, the aircraft has many radios. This is a nice Cessna. And uh, we have a lot of antennas, okay. The first part of the radio is the antenna. When a transmission is sent to an aircraft from the ground, it doesn't matter if it is a communication message, a radio navigation signal emitted by a VOR or an NDV, there has to be an aerial or antenna on board to receive it, okay? So at the back of the airplane, we have the navigation VHF antenna for ILS and VORs. Um, in the upper side, in the roof, let's say it that way, we have two big VHF communication antennas, as we can see here. And uh, be in between them, we have the GPS antenna for the uh, Garmin 1000, if we have it installed. Down here, we have the transponder, XPDR stands for transponder, it's basically a machine that is going to send ADC information about where we are and where, uh, what altitude. Uh, we're gonna be at, right? It's, it's, it's just for information for controllers. I will talk about it in the next slide. We also have a DME, distance measure equipment. We have a marker beacon, okay? This all is for instrumental flying, so I'm not really gonna lose a lot of time here. Really interesting, really nice to fly instrumental, but this is not the cause for that. And here we have the ELT, emergency locator. If you have a problem, this locator is going to automatically trigger with the impact and it's going to send a uh, broadcast message to all the stations around to say that you crashed. Hey, I need help. You can act um, actually action it uh, from the cockpit. But yeah, it's usually automatic. So these are the radios. And these are the radios from the inside, okay? So the radios from the inside, we have this thing called radio panel. We have talked about it in a couple uh, slides before when we talked about the cockpit and where the uh, instruments are located. So yeah, basically once the signal is received, it's going to be transformed and also amplified. And it's, then it's going to be presented to us in different ways. Okay, this picture is the radio panel, as I said, and... Uh, we're gonna get deep into the usage and functionalities that these uh, panels and these radios give to us, okay? So basically, this is the audio control panel. We're gonna control which audio we want to talk to and which audio we want to receive, all right? So um, then we have the autopilot. If we have one fitted, we will talk a little bit about it. We have the COM1, NAV1, RMP, radio management panel is gonna serve to manage the radios and manage what frequency you want to monitor it, the volume, etc, etc. We have the same for radios too. Then we have the DME switching panel. This is just to control the DME system. We talked about it before. We will talk about it later. All right, so this is the ADF switching panel. Exactly the same, but for tuning NVV frequencies. When you study uh, instrumental flying, you will for sure this, use these two. And this is the transponder again. This is really important for us. Is our most uh, basic communication with ATC. We really want to know how to use this and how to operate it. So basically, when you touch that button right there, uh, you're selecting the position of that knob. You're selecting who do you want to talk to. Like uh, you have COM2, COM1, title, int, ext, okay, interior, exterior. Who do I want to talk to? Okay. Then with this, you check and you choose which radio you want to talk to in. All right, so let's think about this. Um, I want to. I have the tower in radio one. I have uh, operations in radio two. 
I want to listen to both of them. So if I want to listen, I want to switch both of them on. Good. Now I only want to talk to operations. So how can I choose to talk to operations or to the tower with these down buttons? As you can see, there it says mic. This here tells us which ones we're going to be talking to. So if one and two are pressed, means that we're going to listen to radio one and radio two. If down here radio one is pressed, means we're going to be talking on radio one. Okay. So don't get confused with this. You will. I did. Everyone did. When you go out there, it's just first day, you, you're nervous, you, you studied everything, you watched this Cessna course for a couple of times, you did your exams, and you're finally prepared to fly. You go out there, you take the mic, and you're like, uh, yeah, I want to get my clearance, please. We will talk about communications later, don't worry. Yeah, I want to get my clearance, please. Uh, and they tell you, no, this is not the correct frequency, and they're like, oh, damn. And then you have to go here. And that's that. So that's how it works. The autopilot, I'm really not going to explain you this because it's a system that you shouldn't use in learning. Okay? You are the pilot. The autopilot is just a damp box that you give inputs to. And as an airline pilot, my experience, be careful what you tell the autopilot because he is so perfect that he cannot disobey rules. Okay? So be very careful what you put in that box. You can turn the knobs and those knobs are going to turn uh, heading, altitude, track that you want the uh, autopilot to maintain, right? And then here you have modes of operation. You want to hold the altitude. You want to follow the ILS. Yeah, it's pretty easy. We don't really need to use it. If you want to know more, we will have further courses on instrumental flying, we will have further courses on um, this kind of uh, advanced systems, but for now, forget about this box. Now, this is the most important one for you, together with the auto control panel, this is the communication radius. So that is uh, the active frequency, that is the nav frequency, that is how you change the frequencies, okay? So I'm going to explain it right now with my laser, here it is. Um, basically, with this, you switch the frequencies. This is the standby frequency, this is the active frequency. So if I want to change this frequency to, let's say, 11815, what do I do? I turn this knob, and it just works. Nah, it's not that easy. I turn this knob, and then it's the standby which changes. Okay, I'm going to change the standby frequency. And then with this button right here, we will see it after in the slide, I'm going to transfer it to the active. And the active is going to get moved to the standby. All right? So, yeah, basically that is the button right there. We have the same in the other box. This is for volume, for the squelch. You will get used to it, don't worry. Play around with your simulator if you have one. If you don't, get close to an airplane, play around. That's the best way to learn these things. Okay, we have one for navigation as well. The DME switching panel. As I said, this is for instrumental flying. Not going to detain a lot on this. It measures the distance. Sometimes it can measure the ground speed. You will also learn about this in instrumental flying. We will do a course about this. Don't worry. And we have a couple modes to switch. But... Just know that it's there. And then we have the ADF switching panel, okay? Uh, we can turn it on, on and off. We can listen to the frequency with the beat frequency oscillator. Uh, if you did your ATPL already, you probably know what this is. And finally, we get to the transponder, the most important system in... Oh, I already said that a couple times. Well, this is a really important system. Anyway, uh, we will have to set a code, as we will see later. This code is going to be input in these uh, um, buttons right here, push buttons right here. You, you push the code, it's going to be a four-digit code like 1200 zero, zero, or 7513 or 7351. It doesn't really matter. It's going to be a code that you're going to get from ATC. That way he can uh, know who you are. It's like your name. 
for ATC. So be careful, don't mess up with the codes. Uh, you're gonna tap it in with the push buttons and then you have this rotary knob. With this rotary knob, we are gonna change from uh, the information we want to give to the uh, controller. You can give the controller altitude. You can only give, maybe you, you don't want to give the altitude for some reason. You just want to give the position. Maybe you are on ground. Maybe you are about to take off. So you don't want to give the altitude on ground, but then you want to give it on the air. So those are the positions we will see it in the procedures section. Okay. After that, now we're going to see how the a Garmin works. Pretty much the same. I'm just going to tell you where everything is. If you want to review what everything is for, go to the slide before and take a look at it. So right here is the audio control panel. Here you have the mic switches. So if I want to talk to mic one on the tower, for example, I want to push this button right here. Here you have the listening. Okay. Who am I going to be talking to? Who am I going to be listening right here? Come one, come two, both of them, even come three if you have one. The telephone at the same time. Can you listen to four times? Um, I mean, four communications at the same time? Because I can't. Anyway, so the same panel as before, but basically it's changed in orientation. Anyway, that's easy. Uh, as I can say, you uh, basically... Tap everything. As, as you know, I, I prepared all this course without knowing that I would have a uh, laser pointer, my favorite thing in this program. But now I do, so yeah, let's work with it. Anyway, this button is really important, manual squelch. With that, you're going to help yourself uh, sequence the radios and try to get a better reception, right? Anyway, you, you can switch the volume up, the volume down. This is a really good pattern as well. This one, what it says here, pilot, passenger. Passenger is in the outside, pilot is in the inside. So if I turn the knob in the inside, I'm gonna be changing the pilot's volume. If I change the knob in the outside, I'm gonna be changing the passenger's volume. Be careful with this, or uh, this is a, per a personal tip or a personal experience. Your instructor is gonna kill you if you turn his volume up to the max by mistake. Anyway, let's keep going with this. The NAV1 and NAV2 RMP, careful. NAV1 and NAV2. We don't have NAV1 and radio communications one in the same thing. We have NAV1 and NAV2 to the left, NAV as you can see, and then we have COM communications to the right, don't get confused with that. It's really easy that you make a mistake. Be careful, all right? So, as I said, COM1 and COM2 are in piece to the right. How do we use that? We have the volume right there. Then we have the uh, switching. This button is the same as the other one. Remember, we switch the frequencies from standby to active. This one is gonna go to active. Active is gonna be in green. And we do it with the uh, switching button, okay? We'll see it after. That's how you do it. And in the comm section, it's exactly the same switching button and volume, okay? The DME and the ADF are both combining the HSI, okay? So this is the good thing about Garmin, guys. This is a good thing about the uh, um, Garmin 1000 and the glass cockpits. Everything is together in front of you. You don't need to look all the way around the cockpit to look at things. DM is in front of you, ADF is in front of you, the horizon is in front of you. As we talked about it before, all the instruments are in front of you guys. So it's really important for you, okay? This is a really big improvement for pilots in uh, terms of uh, situational awareness and all that. All right, we, we also have a map. That's pretty cool. Anyway, the transponder, really, really important. With this key right here, this soft key, we're gonna set the transponder and it's exactly the same. We have a code and we have a mode, okay? On altitude reporting, no altitude reporting. We will see in the procedure section about it. And we have a code. The uh, numbers are gonna get displayed here whenever I push this push button. One, two, three, five, four, five, seven. Are gonna get displayed there so you can choose your code, okay? And 
that's pretty much it. We finished with the Gaumin 1000. We're almost at the end of this session. And now it's time to learn about the computers that compose the Gaumin 1000. Uh, this is not really vital to memories. This is just information that can serve you as a guide to understand and have a global vision on the Gaumin 1000, which uh, has parts. And in case of malfunction, it might allow you to understand the situation better and maybe you might build yourself a better situational awareness in this case. I don't know. Just trying to help. But yeah, this information is good. Anyway, so we are pretty much there. We are almost at the end of the lesson. Now it's time to learn about the computers that compose the coming 1000 system. Uh, more than something vital to memorize this information, it's just maybe a guide um, for you to understand and have a global vision of how the Gaming 1000 works, uh, which are its parts, and in the case of a malfunction, it might allow you to understand the situation better and uh, build yourself a better situational awareness. That's the most important thing here, situational awareness, guys. We, we want to make sure we know basically everything about our aircraft, or if we know everything, we at least know uh, the basic things. So that's what I'm trying to get here. I, I want to get you to know the basic computers that are inside those big and nice screens. Uh, just like in the electrical system, I'm going to break it down in three really small and nice parts just for you to be learning it quickly and easier. Right, so we have consumers, we have the system, and we have the producers. That was the electrical system. Here's a bit different. We have the inputs, we have the system that is going to transform it, and then we are going to have the output, all right? So um, that's so easy. It's, it's just three parts. Here we have some inputs. The air data computer is going to compute uh, air data. <laughs> Basically, it's going to compute the temperature. It's going to compute the airspeed. It's going to compute the pressure to get the altitude. A lot of things. I don't know. If you have studied systems um, or instruments at your flight school, this is basically what the pitot static system do. But a computer is doing it, so it's going to be more precise and way faster. And then we have the AHRS. Holy, that's hard. With the magnetometer connected to it. So, what is this? This is basically a uh, compass that has a sensor at the wingtip, okay? This sensor draws the magnetic field of the Earth and throws it inside of the computer and tells the computer, hey, the north is there, we are pointing here, so we are basically in a 087 course. This is good for us because it's going to make easier navigating. We don't need to touch anything, we don't need to attach the compass, or to adjust the um, horizontal situation indicator, we don't need to do absolutely anything. The computer is going to be doing it for us, as long as the magnetometer is working properly, of course. If not, we're going to get lost. <laughs> but that's all right. Then we have the transponder. The transponder, as we said before, it's drawing information from ADC, throwing out information to ADC. And the last part, the Golf Echo Alpha GEA. 71 is the engine and airframe unit that draws all the cues from auxiliary systems and the engine for our uh, parameters and advisories on the system. So is everything working properly? The computer is going to tell you. All right. Another big input is, of course, the MFD and the PFD. You are tapping these screens all the time. So there is going to be a lot of inputs coming in. In those, then you have the audio panel, as we talked about it before. You can select what do I hear, what do I don't hear. So those are inputs as well. And that's pretty much the inputs, right? So we cannot really put more inputs in there. Um, yeah. So talking about the system, we have two big computers that are interconnected. If one fails, the other one is going to take over, right? So we have the number one, GAA. 63 or 63 W, and then we have the number two, GIA 63 or 63 W. These two things are like the brain of the system. They're gonna take our inputs in red, they're gonna build them, and they're gonna throw some outputs at us in terms of information, 
advisories, lights, audio, whatever you can think of. These computers are going to be in charge of producing this information. All right. And now we have the um, outputs, right? We want to get that information that the system is throwing at us. So we have the outputs. In the upper part right here, we have the PFD and we have the uh, MFD. Of course, um, the PFD is going to throw a lot of information, vital information practically. All our instruments are going to be there. The MFD has maps, checklists, parameters, engine parameters. A lot of information is coming out of there. The audio panel is not actually giving us audio, so I didn't uh, set it as a output. Anyway, down there we have the, um, the the servos for the autopilot. Okay, the Cap 140 that we have right here um, is the uh, the Cap 140 is the autopilot that we're going to be using, and it has some servos that can control the aircraft in case we don't. As I said before, we are the ones that give the autopilot the instructions. Okay, so we're the boss. Don't ever doubt about that. Anyway, we finished with this part. This is the Garmin 1000 for you. Those now we're gonna talk about the last part, the FADEC Full Authority Digital Engine Controller. Um, as I already advanced in the other presentations, it's basically a really important computer that can control all the parameters to make the uh, operation of an aircraft engine easier, more efficient, and overall safer all right so let's take a look so basically the advantages of the fadec of this big computer this intelligent computer controlling our engine all the time more efficient fuel usage optimized mixture okay we have a diesel engine we can optimize that engine so let's give the cpu the information about the engine and the cpu is going to lean or adjust the mixture to get the maximum efficient at all times. It's also gonna be safer. It's not gonna allow you to break the engine on purpose. Like if you move the throttle around, the FedEx is gonna say, whoa, this guy is going crazy. I'm just not gonna do that, right? And continuous parameter monitoring. This system is gonna monitor our engine. It's gonna help us operate safely. But of course there are bad or negative outcomes of the FADEC, these disadvantages of the FADEC. First thing, the system can override the pilot's input. And you might say, well, you, you said that was an advantage and now it's not an advantage. I mean, safer operation of the engine because the pilot cannot do bad things, but now the system can override the inputs because, oh my God, don't worry. I mean, it's good that there is an envelope that we have to respect and that the engine helps us to respect this system. However, imagine the system is not operating correcting. Um, maybe the system decides it's a good time to shut down the engine in the middle of the flight. Well, there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, the system is the boss, full authority engine controller. Okay, that's not go not, not gonna happen. Okay, you, you can reset the FADEC, many things can be done. No worries, if it's in the aircraft, it's because it's safe. But the thing is, the computer has the final word. Now, it needs a continuous electrical source. As we said before, we have a uh, battery just for the FADEC because no electricity, no FADEC means no engine. And no engine means, yeah, your flight is gonna be over soon. I mean, the higher you are, the longer it's gonna take, but you get the idea. Anyway, and it's really complex and expensive. That's why uh, they weren't implemented in small aircraft until now, but nowadays they are advanced, so we can actually start putting them inside general aviation aircraft. So this was it. We've taken a look at the last session at the electrical system of the Cessna, its main components and how the system behaves in different models under certain circumstances. We have learned the advantages, the disadvantages of more and less complex electrical systems. And we have taken a look at the most important consumers in the 172. In this case, the FADEC, the lights, the radios, the avionics, and 
and also we talked about the Garmin computers and lastly the FATIC. So that was pretty much it. Join me in the next lesson to know more about the systems of your Cessna. Cheers guys. This is just the last part of the FATIC. This is just a small um, scheme or drawing that can show you how the FATIC is connected to absolutely everything in the engine as we said before. So uh, we have here the electro hydromechanical control unit. This unit basically controls with mechanical actuators and position sensors. It controls the um, position of the pitch, right? Then we have the pilot throttle. As you can see, the pilot is just one of the many inputs that the FedEx is getting. So, so we are not the boss anymore, right? The FedEx is the boss now. The FedEx is going to give us a display in the cockpit. It needs a power supply, as we said before. There are going to be commands and inputs to and from the engine. Okay, so the engine is going to give us an input. Hey, I'm getting too hot. If you don't cool me down, I'm going to explode. And the FedEx is going to say, okay, let's keep the RPMs down. That's, that's, let's keep it down for a second. The aircraft is also going to give the FedEx some information. Hey, the temperature is high. Hey, the temperature is low. The airspeed is high. The airspeed is low. The engine should be doing this. The engine should be doing that. And yeah, that's basically it. So um, this was it. We have taken a look at the last lesson um, at the FedEx. This is the last thing we talked about. We talked a look at the electrical system of the Cessna, its main components and how the system behaves in the different models and under certain circumstances, for, for example, when the uh, alternator is not working. We have learned the advantages and disadvantages of more and less complex electrical systems. And we have taken a look at the most important consumers in the Cessna 172, the lights, the radios, or the avionics. And in the case of the newer models, we have to add the Garmin computer and the engine FATEC. So, if you want to know more about these systems, go to your POH, read the section about uh, the electrical system, practice drawing the system at home, do whatever you need to do, but keep reviewing the system, really important, and it's going to get more and more important every day. We might even see electrical um, planes in the future. So, if you want to keep learning about the systems of the Cessna, I'll see you on the next one.